live stream where we gather together to uh, learn about God through the scriptures. We gather together to fellowship. I know some of you are gathering on Facebook Live. Others of you are on our website. Wherever you are coming from, we want to just say welcome. Uh, we, we know last week we had engagements with various people, not only from the West Michigan area, but from the states and even from other countries. And so we've now officially gone international or something like that. So wherever you are from, we want to just say thank you so much for gathering with us today. Uh, we want to open the scripture and we want to spend some time together. And before we do that, I just have a couple of quick announcements for us. The first announcement is this. We have been having a fantastic time gathering with our midweek Bible study gathering. That meets at 12 o'clock on Wednesday afternoons. So it's a great kind of lunchtime check-in and time to open up the scriptures together. We've had several people join us, uh, whether they're on their work break or whether they're home or, or even some kids, <clears throat> my kids, uh, have, have joined. And it's been fantastic. Another uh, young person from our church has joined. It's been fantastic. They add so much to it. So uh, if you'd like to join us, we invite you to do that. Um, you can email our office and we'll send you the link this week. Um, we're we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Ruth. We're going to be uh, finishing up chapter one this week. So it's easy to just hop in. Uh, no study required, no homework required. We're super nice people. So uh, that's one thing I wanted to let you know of. The next thing I wanted to let you know of is thank you so much for how so many of you, our church family, have given faithfully during this time. We don't take that um, for granted, and we just want to say, bless the Lord for you. Uh, this, um, all, all these things go to advance the mission of our church, was to know, which is to know Christ and to make him known. And we have the opportunity to do that both on a local scale here as, um, as we gather together, as we meet with people, as we serve our community, uh, as we gather for worship. We also have the opportunity to do that globally as we partner with people who are involved in church planting and disciple making uh, throughout all the world. And so thank you so much for your, um, your gifts there. If you have any questions about giving, you can go to uh, our website and there's some helpful things there. Um, contact information, again, as always, you can email us, you can call us, or you can call the pastor on call. If it's urgent, I really encourage you to call the pastor on call. That's the quickest way that we have to get back in touch with you. If there's anything that we can pray for you uh, regarding, we'd love to be able to do that. You can submit that at prayer at fbczealand.org, or you can, uh, you can contact us through one of these other methods. Um, so just one more thing before we dive into our study for this week, and that's this. Uh, I've been so thankful for all the people who have helped make this happen. Uh, it started off in the narthex with uh, Pastor Tom, Pastor Cameron, and myself, just trying to minimize the amount of people there. And slowly we've brought some of our media and worship team in, uh, because um, although we don't know the time in which we will be gathering together face-to-face again, that, that time is still a little too to be determined, um, we are making preparations for that. And so we've had, we've had um, people helping us out in one way, shape, or form in the last week, especially uh, because we're live streaming from our auditorium now. So we're, we're beginning the process of getting ready to, when we are able to gather uh, together again face-to-face, we're going to be um, also continuing our live stream. So wherever you're at, uh, maybe you're home and you're not feeling well, you can join us on Sunday. Maybe you're out of state, you can join us on Sunday. Maybe you're in another country, uh, you can join us again on Sunday as we open the scriptures. We want to be able to have this connection point for our church in the months and and, um, years to come. And so thank you so much um, for all that to all of you who have helped make this happen in one way, shape, or form. Um, If you're on uh, Facebook, say hi to one of our folks there. They'd love to be able to greet you this morning. If you're on our website, you have a question about anything, there's a chat feature uh, in the bottom right-hand corner. We'd love to be able to connect with you there this morning. And I love, I absolutely love seeing all the photos of your gatherings at home. And so wherever you're at this morning, take a selfie if you wouldn't mind and uh, share it online. Or you can send it to me or you can send it to one of our team. We just love seeing the body of Christ gathered around um, together. And we can do that even though we're not face-to-face right now. Um, Also, as we are making some technology changes this week, please give us any feedback you have. I know every user experience is different. Your internet might be... 
in play there. It might also be something on our end. Please let us know if there's anything we can do to help make this a better experience for engaging with uh, our church community here together. So with all that said, I will say this, on our website you have uh, links to a, a, a lyric sheet for later uh, as we take communion this morning. We're going to be having several songs sung. You can download that lyric sheet there at our website on our watch page. Um, there's also our bulletin. And in our bulletin there's a scripture reading and, and you can meditate upon that scripture reading from the Psalms as we, as we go into our week this week. Uh, but let's go ahead and open up in prayer and let's dive into our teaching for today. Father, we thank you so much for uh, meeting us here. God, wherever we are at, whether we're sitting on our couch or at a kitchen table, whether we're gathered around a phone or a tablet or a computer or a surround sound theater, God, we, um, we gather in your presence. We gather in your presence, and God, there um, you teach us your word. And so, God, I'm, I, I pray this morning that as we open your word, we would have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to set upon the truth that you want to teach us. And that we might be, especially during this time, a people who let the light of Christ shine in us so that they may see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. God, renew our hope again today in your word. Remind us of how great you are, how majestic you are, how holy you are. We bless you, Lord our God, King of the universe, sovereign over all. We bless you and thank you in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. So, um, we are going to be studying, this, is, this has been a series on people of prayer, uh, but we're going to be studying uh, Exodus 15 this morning. So it's kind of like a mini-series within a series. Uh, and one of the things I want to look at is the Song at the Sea. All right, This is one of the oldest hymns in all of the world. And um, here's a, a Jewish perspective, and I think this is helpful for us understanding why songs matter so much. Um, th this is a quote from Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, Heschel's not a follower of Yeshua or, or Jesus. He, he's an Orthodox Jew, and he says this, and I think this helps us understand the purpose of song within the Jewish community. He says this, he says, the primary purpose of prayer is not to make requests. It is to praise, to sing, to chant, because the essence of prayer is a song, and man cannot live without a song. Heschel is doing something very important. He's tying together these two things of prayer and praise. And in modern um, uh, teaching on prayer, one of the popular models of, of teaching people how to engage in prayer is the Acts model. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. You, you might fit this, uh, what we're going to talk about today, into the adoration component because praise is so integral to how we engage with God. It's so integral. The essence, Heschel says, of prayer is a song. A man cannot live without a song. There are times in our life where we're, we're faced with uh, joy or maybe we're faced with trial. And one of the things that God will do sometimes is remind us of a song. And that song is something that directs our hearts and our attitudes and our minds away from ourselves and away from our problems square on God. And that is one of the purposes of music in our life. And so uh, I want to share this photo with you. Several years ago, I was returning from a trip overseas, and we happened upon clear skies. And we're, we're, we're traveling from Europe to Grand Rapids, and we're coming down um, the, the center of Michigan, Michigan, basically. And what you see here is you see a very, very long, it's almost five miles long, bridge. Uh, those of us in Michigan know it as the, the, the Mac, the Mackinac Bridge. Those of you who aren't from around here, look it up. It's pretty cool. And you can even like find some videos of people who take like the Google Earth camera and they go up it, which absolutely freaks me out. Uh, but this is almost five miles long. It's one of the largest suspension, suspension bridges in the Western Hemisphere. But when you look at it from 30,000 feet, it looks pretty small. It looks pretty small. You know, you see lower Michigan, you see upper Michigan, you can see some of the dunes that exist in that area, but when you're looking at it from such a distance, and it's even farther from you because you're at home, and I'm right here in front of the photo, it's really, really small. What I want to make you uh, aware of or help you see 
is that perspective is based oftentimes on location. When we look at God, sometimes we have this idea that God is small. Or that God is something that we can even begin to fully comprehend. One of the things that Exodus 15 reminds us of is that the Lord God is much bigger and greater than we could ever imagine. He's bigger and greater than we could ever imagine. And the purpose of Exodus 15 is simply the magnification of God. It's the exalting of God for who he is and for what he has done. And it's interesting that the covenantal name of God occurs 10 times within this song. We've talked about that before. Yahweh, yod heh vav heh. It's, it's the name of relationship that God has with his people. And they use it over and over and over because th- this is their God. This is our God. This is the God who has just rescued them from the hand of Pharaoh at the Red Sea, at the Sea of Reeds. And this song makes huge claims about an awesome God. And I want to just ask you a question this morning, and that's this. Is your God too small? Is your God too small? Is the way that you look at God, maybe you don't even believe in a God this morning. Is the way that you look at God too small? I think one of the helpful things of this chapter of Scripture is it reminds us that God is great and God is big. And so if you have a a copy of the Scripture, I invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. Um, We we know um, that God has brought his people out for a distinct purpose. While you're turning to Exodus 15, I want to remind you of that purpose. In Exodus chapter 8, The Lord said to Moses, he says, go to Pharaoh and tell him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go. Why? So that they may worship me. God had clear intentions in bringing his people out. It wasn't just to free them from slavery, although it was that. Ultimately, it was so that they would be released from the worship of the gods of Egypt to gather again around the name of the one true God, the one who has saved them and redeemed them, because God's express purpose in bringing his people out is for worship. Now, uh, this word here, worship, it's a fantastic Hebrew word, and it, and it can be translated a couple different ways. One of the ways it's translated is worship. Some of your texts might say, if you were to look it up, they might say serve. Or um, another way this word is translated throughout Scripture is work. And the idea of this word in Hebrew, it, it carries all of these nuances. In other words, your work is your worship. Your worship is your service. Your service is your work. Um, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, he says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all for the glory of God. And I think Paul's understanding a little bit here, whether you're going to work, whether you're cleaning dishes at home, whether you're making uh, a meal to take to someone, whether you're doing some yard work outside, whether you're opening the scriptures, all of these ways are ways in which God calls us to worship and to praise his name. To worship is to work, to work is to serve, to serve is to worship, and the cycle continues to go on. Worship is a big deal, and God actually calls his people out to worship. We find in Exodus chapter 20, you don't have to turn there now, uh, but in Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 and verse 5 especially, we we, we find that, that the first thing God tells his people when they're engaged in this covenant ceremony at Mount Sinai. He says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You shall have no other gods but me. The first thing he wants to remind them of is that their call is to not have other idols. Rather, it is to worship and to serve him alone. I love what it says in verse 5, and I need to remind myself of what it says. It says in verse 4, he says, Don't make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything, in the shadows, in the heavens above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The word there for worship, same word. I am a jealous God. God calls his people out to serve him and to serve him exclusively. To serve him alone. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You are to love him with all of your heart, your soul, and your strength, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the way we love our neighbor is an expression of how we love God. 
Worship is a big deal. In Old English, the uh, word for worship actually comes from a word that means worth-ship. It's to ascribe worth to someone or something. And scripture recognizes that all people worship something. Whether you are a worshiper of God or not, you and I, we all worship something. We all ascribe worth to something. And God is saying here, I want to call them to worship the one who is worthy. The only one who is worthy. I want to call my people to serve me exclusively. And it's the same call for us today. One of the thing, things about the plagues is that the plagues demonstrated that God, that the Lord God was more powerful than every other small g God in Egypt. Um, there, were, there were gods for the sun and gods for the Nile. There, were, there was the god of Pharaoh. And each one of these plagues takes down another Egyptian deity. And it says, you really don't have any power. I, the Lord, am sovereign. I, the Lord, am the only one worthy of worship. And so Exodus 15 comes at the end of this coming out of Egypt, and it's a declaration of praise to the Lord. It's a response to his mighty acts of saving the people from the world's greatest military might, Pharaoh. It's a po- it is poetry that aptly describes a mighty God whose greatness we can only begin to fathom. I say again, is the way that you look at God too small? Is your God too small? Interesting about this, uh, this psalm, and then we'll jump into it, or this, this, uh, this song. Sometimes I'll say psalm because psalm and song kind of go together. Um, is that this song became very special within the Jewish liturgy during Passover, and it was sung frequently during the Second Temple period. Uh, in fact, the Jews of Rome incorporated this entire song into the fixed daily morning service. They made this a part of their practice uh, that, that eventually became universal among the Jews. The daily recitation assumed ever greater meaning as an affirmation that God was good, that his moral governance was all over the world, and it, and it assured them of the ultimate and inevitable downfall of tyrants. And if you look at the history of the Jewish people with any degree of certainty, you, or with any degree of depth, you'll know that there have been many tyrants throughout the ages that have tried to essentially exterminate God's people, Israel. One writer says, such unassailable convictions, the, these convictions of, of what this song says, took on increasing significance for the Jews during the long dark nights of exile and persecution. So regardless of wherever they found themselves, they would sing this song. They would remind themselves, regardless of their situation, how great God is, that God is a saving God. This, um, this song was, it was used customarily to proclaim the kingship of a mighty warrior. In fact, what, what would happen is after a battle, you would often celebrate the, the victor. And it's interesting to note in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. See, they recognized that they had very little, if anything, to do with God saving them. I mean, they, they went forward when God told them to. They, they, they obeyed God's voice, but they didn't save themselves. God saved them. Here, it is not Moses or Israel that is getting any praise. It's God. And in the words of Douglas O'Donnell, he says it this way. He says, the purpose of the Exodus is worship. Not merely freedom from Egyptian slavery, but freedom from Egyptian idolatry. That's what God is freeing them from. Not just slavery, but, but, but worship or service to Pharaoh. So that they might worship God. And so let's dive into the text. And uh, we're going to break this up in a couple different parts. And I'm just going to put the, the major headings up here for you and make some comment as we go through this song together. Um, the first three verses have to do with this. Israel's praise to the Lord. All right, it's Israel's play, praise to the Lord. Singing um, is a biblical expression. And so it says here, um, they said, verse 1, this is halfway through verse 1, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and his rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. So we get a couple different things, but this is all geared towards praising the Lord. 
singing the biblical expression that declares who God is and what he has done. And this is very poetic. You know, he's, he's highly exalted. The horse and his rider, he is thrown into the sea. The, the emotion in this song is evident. But I want just to under, underscore something really quick. Emotion without truth is empty. Some traditions throughout the history of the church have emphasized the experience of worship, while others have, have emphasized a, um, a, a head knowledge. And I want to suggest to you that, that both are important. Both are important. I cannot imagine that Israel was gathered around not passionately singing this. And yet these are words of truth that Moses and the, and the Israelites have on their lips about who God is. Because all biblical worship begins with who God is. We are to sing with understanding. And this understanding of who God is should result in joy, which is a fruit of God's spirit in our life. Both of these are important. Both of these are important. And, and if we seek to judge our worship simply by experience, we, we, we might miss the truth of who God is. And, and if we talk about the truth, but that truth doesn't begin to penetrate who we are, maybe we haven't fully comprehended what we are singing. Verse 2 occurs. This is an interesting verse. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. It's, it's an interesting verse because it occurs in every section of the Hebrew Bible. Without going into it, the Hebrew Bible is divided into three sections. It's in a, it's in a slightly different order than the way it is in most uh, American Protestant Bibles. Um, and it's divided into three sections. The, the Torah, or, or the law, the, the prophets, and the writings. This phrase, the Lord is my strength and my song, occurs in each section of the Hebrew Bible. It's representative of something I think God wants to teach his people throughout all of time. Uh, in the Torah here, it's, it, it's, regard, it's with regard to Israel's freedom from Egypt's hold. In Isaiah 12, it's when the Jews are regathered to enjoy the blessings of the land and the writings. It's Psalm 118, which if you joined us for our Good Friday um, Bible study slash teaching a couple, a couple weeks ago. We studied a little bit of that. And in verse 14, this is quoted. And, and th- this song is something that has endured through many generations. Verse 2 also includes an, an exclusive command. It says, this is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. One writer said it this way. He said, the God whom I acknowledge as my Lord and whom I wish to serve with all my heart and soul. That's what the writer is saying here, is that I, I acknowledge God as my God, and I wish to serve him. I'm all in. But then we come to verse 3, and it's this phrase, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And we're going to continue to pick up this idea of warrior and kingship in the next couple verses. Verses 4 through 10 talk about the Lord's victory over the enemy. He threw Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. Verse 4. The elite of his officers were drowned in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy. You overthrew your adversaries by your great majesty. You unleashed your burning wrath. It consumed them like stubble. The waters heaped up at the blast of your nostrils. The currents stood firm like a dam. The watery depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire will be gratified at their expense. I will draw my sword. My hand will destroy them. Note verse 10. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. These verses talk about the Lord's victory over the enemy. And these, take, these verses take great care to describe the power of the enemy. This was the best of the best. It was the best chariots. It was the best fighters that Pharaoh had to muster. They were among the best in the world, if not the best at this time. But these were people who were not innocent. Pharaoh and his army were an oppressive regime. They, they, they had held God's people in slavery for 400 years. They had given opportunities. They had been given opportunities to let God's people go. They are against God. They are against God's purposes. Even when, when Moses says, chapter 8, we looked at it, let my people go so they may serve me. One of the first things Pharaoh says is, I, I, I don't know your God. All right? In Pharaoh's mind, the Lord God was not important at all. 
So what happened? Well, hardness and hardness and hardness was exhibited and God, God made the heart of Pharaoh hard and um, <clears throat> they, they had the plagues. God brings them out and he rescues them. He says in verse 9, The enemy said, I will pursue, overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire will be gratified at their expense. My hand will destroy them. The, the intentions of Pharaoh are clear. But what was the end result? Well, the Lord's right hand in verse 6 powerfully shattered them. His holy and just wrath consumed them in verse 7. And he blew with his breath and the sea covered them. There was judgment that happened here. But it was holy, righteous judgment. Sometimes we have a difficult time reconciling the Lord as a warrior and the way that we look at God. Sometimes we, we, we look at God as being um, merciful and compassionate, and he is. But the Lord is also holy and just. And one of the things we need to remember is that our picture of who God is is only a fraction of who he really is. He's revealed himself to us in many different ways. Um, and, and he comes to each of us and he invites us into relationship with him. And he says, I want you to go and I want you to share the message of the gospel with other people. Because see, we were all once, all of us once separated from God. We were deserving of God's wrath. But people who have had their faith and trust placed in the Messiah, Jesus, have experienced what is called new birth, new life. Not because of what we've done. Salvation doesn't come from our hands. It comes from the Lord's. We, sometimes we struggle with this concept of the wrath of God, but, but we have to remember that God's wrath is consistent with his holy character and his justice. And in fact, God's wrath it is a way that justice is finally set right. We, we, we all, met, or I should say many of us, Look upon injustices in our world. One day God will make all things that are unjust just with his holy and righteous judgment. Romans 1 teaches that, the, that God's wrath is revealed against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people in uh, chapter 1 verse 18. And this passage is often uh, used in conversations uh, be, be, because it describes sin. But the heart of the issue with all sin comes back to this idea of worship and idolatry. The, 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 the heart of all sin is I have forsaken the Lord and I have chosen to go my own way. Romans 1 verse 21 through 23 say this. It says, For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. We're really good about replacing God. We're really good. We can replace God with almost anything. But it leads us down a path a very wayward path. Verse 24 says, Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshipped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forevermore. God invites people into relationships so that their worship might be properly aimed at who he is and what he has done. The next phrase comes down to this question, who is like the Lord? Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You will lead the people you have redeemed with your faithful love. You will guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. We live in a culture that wants to make everything great and awesome. We, we, we assign those words to so many things. That's the best of that. And oh my goodness, did you ever see that? We quickly settle for lesser things in this world. One of the things that this song reminds us of is that there is no one else like our God. One result of biblical worship is that it reminds us and sets our eyes again on just how magnificent and awesome God is. Not the things of this world, not ourselves, but how magnificent God is. 
Verse 13 ties God's redemption, which is a promise that he made in Exodus chapter 6, that he would bring them out and redeem them. It ties God's redemption with his loyal love. In Hebrew, it's this word chesed. For those of you who are joining us in our Ruth Bible study this week, we talked a little bit about this word because it's an important word within the story of Ruth. Um, It's a word that can be translated favor, loyal love, or grace. We, we see God's grace throughout all of Scripture. And we see it here. You will lead the people you have redeemed with your faithful love, with your chesed, with your grace. You've redeemed them with your grace. You will guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. Let me make it very clear. Israel has not earned this salvation. It is a gift of God's grace. God's chesed. The next section of the song talks about the reaction of the Lord's foes. God's power, uh, well, let me read it to you. Um, Verses 14 through 16. When the peoples hear, they will shudder. Anguish will seize the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be terrified. Trembling will seize as the leaders of Moab, or seize the leaders of Moab. The inhabitants of Canaan will panic and terror and dread will fall on them. They will be as still as a stone because of your powerful arm until your people pass by, Lord. Until the people whom you you purchase pass by. God's power not only brings fear of the Lord to Israel. um, His fear actually comes upon the nations. What might be the result of this? Well, I, I, was, I was reading this uh, past week in the book of Joshua. And um, there's a person there, Rahab, who is a part of the city of Jericho. When Israel comes into the land, um, the first uh, city that they have to deal with is Jericho. And Jericho was formidable. They send a couple spies there. Rahab goes ahead and, and, and she keeps them secure. Um, But one of the things that Rahab had experienced is that she had heard about God's amazing acts. She had heard about how God had been leading Joshua and the people and Moses and the people. But she had even heard, Scripture says, about this Red Sea experience. And there's 40 years in between them because there was a whole generation that died in the wilderness because of their unfaithfulness. And so... um, It's interesting. Something remembered 40 years prior still struck fear within the hearts of people within the land. She trusted, Rahab trusted in God, and she gave safety to the spies of Israel. When we see God's works for what they are, they rightly should cause all people to go, what just happened there? The last two verses... You will bring them, verse 17, in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. The Lord will reign forever and ever. These verses talk about the dwelling place of the king. The dwelling place of the king. These verses envision God forming a people for himself. Amongst the various dynasties, tribes, and tongues, it describes a people who come under God's rule and kingship. It's summed up so well. Um, The Lord will reign forever and ever. Many scholars have noted this is the first place in Scripture where God is proclaimed as king. Now, he's always been king, but this is, the, this is a, a very distinct place in Scripture where God's kingship is made known to God's people. One writer says it this way, The poem of Exodus 15 celebrates Yahweh present with his people and doing for them as no other God anywhere and at any time can be present to do. So I want to ask you something. It, is your God too small. As you look at these um, passages from Scripture, how do you view God? Is God um, small in your eyes? Oh, he's just like everyone else. Or is he a God who rightly blows with his nostril in the water's part? Who takes down whole enemy armies who are after his people? who meets his people 
who is present with his people, who does things for them, including bringing them salvation by his grace. How do you view God today? Our God is small. We have a small vision of God when we believe that he neither cares about or has the power to meet us in the situations that we face. Our our God is small when our circumstances appear bigger than God. Our vision of God is small when we substitute him quickly and easily for cheap imitations made by human hands. Our God is small when we allow other kings to rule our hearts instead of the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. This song reminds us truly how big God is and it calls God's people to worship. Who is like you among the gods? There is no one like our God. The Lord will reign forever and ever. I mentioned earlier how we find parts of this song throughout the Bible. It's incredibly important within the story of God's people, but it doesn't just end during the Second Temple period or with the Jewish community. I want to read for you from Revelation chapter 15, which is where we also find this song mentioned. Revelation 15 says this in verse 3. It says, They sang, they sang the song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb. There's two songs that are sung. The song of Moses, this one right here, and the song of the Lamb. And I want, I want to end, before we transition into a time of communion, and I'll give some more instruction about that in just a moment, I want to read you the song of the Lamb. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Not just King of Israel, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. We have seen God's righteous acts. You want to know the, the, the most poignant, the most grand example of God's righteous acts? The book of John says it this way. In John 3, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him, will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. He sent him so that the world might be saved through him. Now one day, the Lord Jesus will come again and he will judge. He will judge. Right now, he says, I long to be with you. I long to be your God. I long for you to follow in my ways. And he has made a way possible. And that is through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And that is what we celebrate when we gather for communion. And so wherever you're at in your homes, communion is this. It's the reminder that Christ died and rose again. And by believing and trusting in that and in that only, we can have life in his name. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, I invite you to grab, uh, hopefully, if you have it, some unleavened bread, maybe some grape juice, some fruit of the vine, um, or, uh, you know, grab, grab what you have. Um, this is a remembrance. This is a remembrance. Communion is a practice for the follower of Jesus that reminds us of what Christ has done on our behalf, and it proclaims what Christ has done for us. And Jesus, uh, or the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, he took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This is the cup of redemption in the, in the cups of the Passover Seder. And he says, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so wh- whether you're at home by yourself today or whether you are gathered around with family, I invite you, I invite you to celebrate Christ's body broken and his blood poured out. Let's, let's celebrate this remembrance. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you time to do that. I, I actually encourage you to take a couple moments to pray, to consider your heart before God, to, to ask God, God, is there any wicked way in me that you want me, that I need to confess, that I need to walk in your goodness and in your grace? 
and ask God for the power and the help to do that. If you don't know Jesus today, you can come to have a personal relationship with him by believing that he died and rose again, that he is the only way to salvation. And we invite you to do that because that, that, is, that is the best thing you, can, you could ever do. Totally changes and transforms your life, gives you purpose and gives you meaning. But what we're going to do here is we're going to transition to a time of singing. Um, singing is appropriate. Israel and Moses, they sang this song to the Lord, and we are going to sing to the Lord as we do this. So go ahead, during these next few songs, take these elements at home. We're going to sing while we do that, and then we are going to, uh, I'll come up and share a couple of, of last concluding thoughts and a prayer, and we'll be done. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much that, that you sent your Son, your one and only Son, whom you love, to be our representative, to be our substitute, to be the lamb who would die, who could perfectly and wholly take care of sin in this world. God, we trust you. Um, We thank you for your sacrifice. We praise your glorious and awesome name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah and our Redeemer. Amen.
He's the great I am
every believer the promise of God The vilest offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Great things he had taught us, great things he had done But greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son But purer and higher and greater will be I wonder our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He had done. Sing glory, 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 give him glory, great things he had done. Glory, 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 give him glory, great things he had done. Glory, 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 give him glory, great things he had done. Glory, 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 glory. He had done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He had Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, a couple of things before we close. Number one, if there's any way we can pray for you or support you, uh, please let us know. There's contact information on our website. We'd love to be able to get in touch with you this week. Number two, uh, if you've gathered around with your family this weekend or you're by yourself, take a picture. Uh, we'd love to see you gathered around uh, engaging with God's word. And if you have any questions or you want to dialogue about the passage or about what God is doing in your life during this time, uh, we would love to be able to do that. Um, you can always follow um, our website for the most updated information. Uh, feel free to reach out if there's any way we can serve you. Let's pray together, and then we will uh, close our time together today. Lord Jesus, to God be the glory, great things you have done. We celebrate the work that you have done in and through, in and through your death, burial, and your resurrection. We celebrate your body broken and your blood poured out for the sin of mankind. And we remember again, God, what it cost you for us to experience freedom. And not just freedom from the slavery of sin, but freedom to worship the one and only God. And God, I, I, I know for, for myself and probably for my brothers and sisters out there, I know that our lives so quickly become consumed by the things around us. But God, I pray that you would help us this week to rightly lift our eyes to the one who is above all. God, that you would remind us again of what you have done so that we might go and we might be people who share this message of good news, this good news of Jesus with our world. We bless you. We thank you for your good gifts to us this day. Now, Lord, may you bless your people. May you make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. 
May they experience the peace that comes only through Jesus this week as we face whatever things come our way. We trust you, God. We glorify you in and amidst all other things. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Together we say, wherever you're at, amen. Have a blessed day. Thanks so much for joining us today. God be with you.